in start class. In last class, we have discussed about the polite transformation. And as I already told you, for the formation of the polite, carbon should be redistributed mm -hmm. between ferrite and cementite. And uh, the way through which the carbon can be distributed, we can consider two different processes. One is the carbon diffusion through the austenite lattice. And the second one is carbon diffusion through the interface between the polite and the austenite. And when we consider the growth of the polite through the carbon diffusion in the austenite, austenite lattice, we can drive the velocity of the interface by considering the carbon content in austenite in front of ferrite side and in front of cementite side. Because the carbon should be accumulated in front of the ferrite side because ferrite reject carbon. And carbon concentration will be dropped. Carbon, the carbon content will be depleted in front of the cementite because cementite absorb the carbon. And the carbon content in cementite and ferrite and the ratio of the interamellar spacing. Actually, when we determine the interlamellar spacing from the mass balance equation, we can evaluate each thickness of the ferrite and cementite. So the only thing we have to know is to evaluate the carbon content in austenite side and carbon content in cementite and ferrite to evaluate the growth rate of the polite. But one thing we have to consider further is that the formation of the polite should be accompanied by the formation of the interface between ferrite and cementite. So interface energy between ferrite and cementite should be considered to evaluate the velocity. Actually, so those kind of the formation of interface will, will affect the carbon content in austenite side. Let's see how it occurs. When you consider the interlamp spacing of S, then this, when we consider, when we think Vm as molar volume of the polite, then this amount of interface will exist in one mole of the polite. So this is total area of the interface. So when we multiply it by the interface energy between ferrite and cementite, then this amount of energy will be consumed to form an interface during the polite reaction. <coughs> it means that among the total driving force, which is available for the transformation, this amount of driving force will, should be used to make the interface. So as I told you, when the transformation is fully controlled by the diffusion, it means that there is no energy consumption for atom to across the interface. Similarly, when we need another additional energy to make the interface, inside of the product phase. 
it will changes. It will change the equilibrium concentration at the interface. How much? Let's say this solid line is initial condition of our polite transformation. If all of the driving force consumed by diffusion, then the equilibrium concentration of carbon in austenite in front of the ferrite will give by this point. And the equilibrium carbon concentration in front of the cementite will give by this position. Right? But actually, some part of the driving force is consumed by making the interface, which how about this amount of driving force is consumed by making the interface. So it has a similar effect to increase the free energy of the ferrite and cementite by this amount. So the carbon concentration will deviate from the original composition. How much? So we can construct the common tangent again, and this will be the carbon concentration in austenite in front of the ferrite, and this will be the carbon concentration in austenite in front of the cementite. When you consider could the, carbon con the effect of the interface on the carbon concentration in cementite and ferrite, it has a less effect because, as you know, the free energy curve of the cementite is very narrow, sharp, very narrow shape. So this amount of free energy increase will have negligible effect on the equilibrium concentration of the cementite, carbon in cementite. Similarly, the concentration of the carbon in ferrite is very small. Actually, this figure is very exaggerated one. Actually, the free energy curve of the ferrite is very close to this axis. So it also have negligible effect. And what will be the theoretically minimum value of the interlamellar spacing? When the driving force is completely consumed to make the interface, then the interlamellar spacing will be will have theoretical minimum, right? So all the driving force is consumed by making the interface. The interlaminal spacing is given by this one, and this value will be the theoretical minimum of the interlaminal spacing when the polite transformation occurs. So from this from this tool, the driving force available for the diffusion is will be the difference between the total driving force and the driving force necessary to make the interface. So you can get this formula. <coughs> 
And when you consider the real concentration, the ratio of the real concentration and the equilibrium concentration, this is, that is this length and this length, the, the carbon concentration difference. This value will be one if all of the driving force is consumed by the diffusion. And will be zero, all of the driving force is used to making to make the interface. So we roughly approximate the ratio is similar to the ratio of the driving force, the drive force of diffusion to total driving force, right? Is it okay? So when we put this equation into one and the ratio of the carbon difference in carbon concentration will be given by one minus S zero divided by S. So when we return to the original equation which, des which describe the velocity of the polite interface, now we have some quantitative value for this part, right? And this is similar to this one, and when we switch this value with this one, then finally you can have this kind of equation. And now we can evaluate the velocity from the equilibrium phase diagram. Actually, the ratio between the interlamella spacing and the thickness of the ferrite and cementite is actually and this is. volume fraction of the cementite and ferrite in the polite, and finally we can have this kind of equation. When you look at this formula, to evaluate the velocity of the interface, we have to know the interlamellar spacing. What I mean is that this equation is just a relationship between the velocity and the interlamellar spacing. So to evaluate the velocity, we have to know the interlamellar spacing. When you think about the interlamellar spacing and velocity, what which interlamellar spacing has the highest possibility to be observed. There is a variety of interlamellar spacing, small one to larger one. And we know the velocity of the polite strongly depend on the interlamellar spacing. Then among various size of interlamellar spacing, which one has the highest possibility to be observed. It is natural the interlamellar spacing which give highest velocity have better chance to be observed. 
No. For example, this is interlaminar spacing, and this is velocity of the interface. For example, this has this kind of function, for example. Then the polite which have this interlaminar spacing will have highest value, highest growth rate. Right? So the polite has which has this much of interlaminar spacing will have chance, better chance to occupy most of the microstructure because it has highest growth rate. Okay? So with this formulation, the interlamellar spacing which give highest growth rate is 2s0 and we put 2s0 here then finally we can have this formulation The second one is that the diffusion along the interface, the carbon diffusion along the interface between the polite and austenite. And the procedure is similar to the previous one. The amount of carbon transported by the diffusion along the interface is given by this equation. And delta here, delta is the thickness of the interface and H is proper depth perpendicular to this screen. And K is partitioning coefficient, which represent the ratio of the carbon in austenite lattice and interface. It is natural that the concentration of carbon will be different the concentration carbon in interface and austenite will be different. So to consider that difference, we introduce the partitioning coefficient K. So this is nothing more than the fixed first law. And this is the mass balance equation we already we've already drive in the previous class. So let's combine these two <coughs> to drive the velocity of the interface. Then you can have very similar form with the previous one in this equation. And to consider the role of the interface between the ferrite and cementite you can have this. Actually, this one is equivalent to this, this one, as we derived previously. And finally, we can have this equation. Similar to the previous one, the interlamellar spacing, which has the highest possibility, it will will be that one which gives highest velocity. So in this formulation, you can drive that the interlaminar spacing which gives highest velocity is given by this one. And finally, we can have this kind of formulation. And 
the, the only difference between the previous one is that the previous one, which considered the carbon diffusion through the austenite grain, grain is proportional to one of one over s, but here the velocity is proportional to one over s square. To obtain this relationship, just sorry, yeah, just differentiate this this part with respect to S, then you will have the critical size of the interlamellar spacing, which give the maximum velocity. Okay. This compare the calculated velocity and measured one, observed one. Here the this symbol represents the observed velocity of the course rate of the polite and this so the line indicate the velocity based on the diffusion through Austin grain. The first case. The so as you can see, when we con consider when you assume the carbon diffusion occurs through the austenite lattice then the calculated growth rate is sl slower than the observed one. Observed one is faster than the calculated one, which means that there is some roar of the carbon diffusion along the interface. Next, let's briefly think about the degree of the supercooling and uh, interlamellar spacing. Can you remember this relationship? Maybe I told you this relationship in uh, when I talk about uh, phase transformation in. Uh, one component system. This is the driving force for the transformation and H is the difference in enthalpy and delta T is degree of the supercooling and T is equilibrium temperature where the transformation occurs. Right? You can find some derivation when you look at the uh, handout in previous class. So you have to remember that this relationship can be applied when the degree of supercooling is small. So let's compare this equation and this equation. This is total driving force as a function of the degree of supercooling and the change of enthalpy. And this is a driving force for the polite transformation. When we compare these two equations, you can understand that the interlamellar spacing is inversely proportional to the degree of supercooling. It means when we have large supercooling, then we can obtain 
the polite with very small intergranular spacing. All right? So actually, when we compare the interlamellar spacing with the degree of supercooling in ion carbon binary system, this has quite good linear relationship with supercooling and the interlamellar spacing. Why there is some deviation as we decrease the temperature? At first, it has quite good linear relationship, but it starts to deviate when the temperature is decreased. Yeah. As I told you, this relationship is hold for the small supercooling. So as the supercooling increase, this relationship cannot be applied. So that's why when the degree of supercooling increase, the relationship is deviated from the linear one. Okay, anyway, If we can assume that this line is a, this extrapolated line is a, uh, can be ap approximated into the linear one, then the carbon equilibrium carbon concentration in austenite, which is equilibrium state in ferrite, and the austenite, which is equilibrium in cementite, the difference will be proportional to the degree of supercooling because that is simply this length, right? This one, when we consider the difference between the carbon concentration, it is nothing more than the length at some temperatures and this is the degree of supercooling. So when we increase the degree of supercooling, then this term also increase. So, and when we assume this line is somewhat linear line, then the degree of supercooling is proportional to this term. And we already say the degree of supercooling is inversely proportional to the interlamellar spacing. So this is the growth rate equation we already derived. And this term is inversely proportional to the interlamellar spacing. So it means that when the growth of polite in, is controlled by the carbon diffusion in austenite, then the velocity will have constant and one over square of the interlaminar spacing. And when the carbon diffusion is controlled by the diffusion along the interface, 
it will proportional to the 1 over Q of the internal analysis spacing. So when you have some data on the velocity of the interface when per light grow, and you can measure interlamel spacing. Then from the relationship between the velocity and interlamellar spacing, you can determine what kind of diffusion. It means that the, the, the diffusion is controlled by the, the diffusion through the austenite or the diffusion along the interface can be determined. Of course, in typical case, the value you have between the value, be between the two and three, which means that both diffusion through the austenite grain and the diffusion along the interface can contribute to the growth of the polite. Okay, <laughs> not okay. When I first start these lectures at March, your face is very, looks like happy. But as time goes, your face becomes serious and serious. Any problem? If you have any question about the content of the lecture, please let me know. I'm ready to assist you. Important thing is to know the content. Of course, to get a higher grade is also important. But in my opinion, to know the content is the most important thing. And that's why you are here from the very early in the morning. When I was a graduate school student, 9.30 is really, really early in the morning. <laughs> okay, I'd like to introduce you somewhat different kind of the polite uh, detectoid transformation. Usually when we talk about the eutectoid transformation in steel, it, it, it means that the polite, the plate type, cementite, and the alternating layer of the cementite and ferrite, cementite, and ferrite. But sometimes there is a different kind of eutectoid transformation occurs, which is called divorced eutectoid transformation. In usual eutectoid transformation, what you can observe is the lamella structure of the ferrite and polite. But when the diverse eutectoid transformation occurs, what you observe is the round shape cementite in the matrix of the ferrite. <clears throat> this kind of diverse eutectoid transformation is very important in process called spheroid, spheroidization. Spheroidization is that to make the, to, to convert the lamella structures into this kind of structure with round shape cementite in the ferrite matrix. Then why we 
have to convert the lamella structure into this kind of spherodized one. Yeah, the thing is that this kind of spherodized structure is much softer structure. So it is very easy to cold foam. Most of the steel product for the, to make bolt or bearings or other things containing high carbon, the final microstructure is based on the tempered martensite. For, to obtain the tempered martensite, we have to heat up the specimen and quench and temper. But before the heat treatment, we have to make the shape. For example, the shape of the ball or shape of the fasteners, bolt, nut. Those kind of shape is fabricated by cold forming. Cold forming means that we shape the part at the room temperature. But when the microstructure has the perlite structures, it is very difficult to do a cold forming. Because as you know, the strength of the polite is dependent on the interlamellar spacing. And the interlamellar spacing is usually far less than one micrometer. So the strength of the polite is quite high. So that's why we want to convert the lamella structures into the, this spherodized one. The important transformation which can be used to make this spherodized microstructure is divorced eutectoid transformation. For the divorced eutectoid transformation, we have to have very fine seed of the cementite. And how can we make the, this kind of seed? Just hold the sample in two page region of the austenite and cementite. And some part of the lamella cementite dissolved and fragmented and have this round shape, very small seed. Then we cool down the sample with very slow cooling rate. I told you very slow cooling rate, which permit the carbon redistribution as the movement of the interface between ferrite and austenite. As you know, the carbon solubility in ferrite and austenite is quite different. There are many carbon in solid state in austenite, but there is negligible carbon in solid state in ferrite. So as the interface moves, the difference <coughs> of the carbon, the carbon which correspond to the difference in solubility has to move where move to cementite around the interface. The carbon should transport it in this direction or this direction. So as the movement of the interface, the carbon, uh, the cementite, will be coarsened. Will will be coarsened. That that is the way not to make the cementite in lamella structures. And that's why we need 
those kind of seed, cementite seed, to make this round shape cementite. So now you can understand why we need very slow cooling rate over here. When we apply fast cooling rate, there is no time for carbon to diffuse onto the cementite particle around the interface. So it just precipitates as a lamella cementite. So usually in industrial application, the process time to make this spherodized structure is about one or two days. It takes quite a long time. It, it takes much longer time. When we hold the polite structure here, you mean? Here? Then the microstructure will be the cementite and austenite. Sorry? Boundary of what? Of the rain. Uh, Austin I rain. Grain boundary. Yeah, grain boundary. So we have to control the time, holding time over here. As you know, as you mentioned, if we take too much time here, then all of the cementite particle coarsen. So we cannot have this kind of fine seed. So we have to control, also control the holding time at this partial austenizing temperatures to obtain this fine seed structure. So what I mean one day is that it takes about one day to cool down from these intercritical temperatures to obtain the final microstructure. Not okay? This is austenite grain, and at first, the microstructure has the protectoid cementite and grain boundary. And there is some colony and the polite, the cementite, politic cementite is look like, it, like this. So when we hit this sample to these intercritical temperatures, of course, the matrix alpha will convert to austenite. At the same time, the cementite starts to dissolve. Right? So the dissolution of this kind of cementite will form this kind of fragmented structure. Right? Of course, when we hold this sample quite a long time at these this temperatures, then the coarsening 
will occur and the microstructure will looks like this one. So we have to stop the heat treatment before coarsening of cementite occurs. One of the reasons why we put chromium on those kind of high carbon steel is to prevent the coarsening process. Addition of chromium effectively separate the dissolution process and coarsening process. Okay, that is beyond this, uh, beyond the content of this class. And so let's consider what will be the criteria to obtain those kind of divorced detectoid transformation. For the divorced detectoid transformation, as the movement of this interface between the austenite and ferrite, the carbon should be redistributed to the adjacent cementite. So this will be the amount of the carbon which should be redistributed as the interface moves and which is compensated by the diffusion along this side and this side. So we can say when this relationship holds, then the divorced detectoid transformation occurs. So even though it is quite empirical approach, we can derive the, each value from the equilibrium page diagram, diagram of ion carbon system, and finally we can have this kind of relationship. So the velocity is a function of degree of supercooling, and this is a length which is which can be replaced by the spacing between the particle. So when you compare this velocity with the typical velocity of the polite transformation with respect to the degree of supercooling, then we can map where the lamella type transformation is possible and where the divorced detectoid transformation is possible as a function of the supercooling and the spacing of the particle. Here, this spacing is not the interlaminal spacing. This is the spacing between the particle, particle of this particle of this seed. So when you look at this map, to obtain the divorced ejectoid transformation, we have to very fine cementite seed at initial structures and very low degree of sparkling, which correspond very slow cooling from the intercritical annealing temperatures. Okay. Okay, this is the last slide. So any question? No? Okay, then see you on this Thursday. <laughs>